I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm glad to be here. I'm going to talk to you tonight for just a few minutes about the forces that are arrayed against you. And I won't be here all night with it, but I want to, I'm going to cover five different forces that are arrayed against you. The flesh, the world, Satan, demons, and religion. If you have your Bible, turn to Ephesians 4, verse 23. The Scripture says, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The battle is for your mind. That is the beginning of the assault upon you. What you put into your mind comes through your heart and out and works itself out in your life. If you put, if you put the, if you, if you constantly feed your mind with a philosophy and decadence and the ungodliness of this world, then you will be, uh, your mind will become corrupted because your mind is a battleground. For example, right now, when you're sitting in this auditorium here listening to me, do you have a, do you have a single eye? Or is your, heart, is your heart mixed? If your eye is single, as the Lord Jesus talked about, then that means that your heart is single. You are focused that your mind is set on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to do that. Now let me tell you what to do. This helps me. Uh, how many of you have thoughts come into your mind that you don't want? And how many times does your mind wander when you're trying? Exactly. That's the way the human mind is, is, is made. When that happens, Start singing that song of Zion that you love about the Lord Jesus, or just talk to him, or start calling his name out, and you'll be amazed at how quickly that leaves you and your mind gets focused right back on where it should be. It helps me, and I focus my mind on the Lord Jesus. Throughout the day, I mention him, I don't know how many times, my mind focuses upon him. I may be trying to read the scripture, and here goes my mind wandering off on something. You know, think about something. You're reading the Word of God, and then all of a sudden, here you're thinking about something that you need to do, or something that you did, or something said. You know, just wander away from the book. Mention the name of Jesus, and Lord Jesus, I want your Word. Put me back in your Word. And you'll be amazed at how it goes. It goes right back into the scripture. Here's the second thing, the world. Look at 1 John chapter number 2, and verse number 16. 1 John 2.16. Now, of all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John says much more about the world than the others. Now, the others do. This is not trying to contrast and pit one against another. It's to try to bring out for you the burden of the Gospel of John. You remember when I preached from the Gospel of John Sunday morning? And I told you that it is written that you might believe. The Gospel of John is probably the last gospel to be written because John was the last apostle alive. And he wrote the book of Revelation 90, 95 AD. The gospel of John could have been written somewhere along then, long after the Jewish kingdom had been rejected, the Jewish Messiah had been rejected, and now his burden was the Son of God, the Savior of all mankind. Well, I want you to notice here now when he writes about the world in 1 John chapter number 2 and verse 16, the same apostle, Apostle John, 1 John 2, 16. Now watch this. For all that is in the world, the definition of the world, the world, the world system, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. That is a force arrayed against you. What's that? Your culture. America is sinking in sin. You agree with that, don't you? <laughs> it, is, it is sinking in the cesspool. A good illustration of that would be Jeremiah, the Old Testament, when they let him down in the pit, and he began, he began to sink into the mire. Well, that's what's happening. America is sinking in the mire. It's getting darker by the day. That is a force arrayed against you. You've got to be conscious of the fact that the culture that you live in today is anti-Christ. Number three, 
Look at 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 8. This is a force arrayed against you, and that is Satan. 1 Peter 5, 8. The scripture says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. <clears throat> that word devour is remarkable. <clears throat> it doesn't mean where a, a predator would kill its prey and eat it. Uh, you know, what it literally means is that if you're literally swallowed down, gulps you down, finishes you off. That's his purpose. Satan wants to destroy you. Now watch carefully in verse number nine. This is in the same context. Whom resist? Resist the devil. That's the way to deal with him. Resist him. The Lord Jesus resisted him when he said, get thee hence. Resist the devil. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. He assaults your faith knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. If you see the afflictions, you understand that we are not exempt from the sufferings that come upon mankind. The fact of the matter is, that which works for evil to men works for good to God's people. Yes, it does. Affliction or suffering or anything like that has a purpose for God to use for the glory of God. The Bible said, He that hath suffered hath ceased from sin. The Apostle Peter says a lot about suffering. And he says, if you suffer, commit your soul unto him as to a faithful keeper, to a faithful God. Commit yourself to him. Suffering in this life is to fill up the measure of the sufferings of Christ. That's a strange thing if you don't think about it. But if you begin to think about it, you say to yourself, well, he suffered, didn't he? And he, he suffered uh, when he was in this world because he was not of this world. And not being of this world, then he could never be comfortable in this world. He could never call this world his home. He was passing through this world. He said, I'm of, not of the earth. You're earthy of the earth. I'm from above. So the apostle says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. When you do suffer afflictions, that's going to happen because that's part of what is happening now to you as a Christian, preparing you for what God has in store for you in the future. For he said, I reckon the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. We are one day going to reign with him because we've suffered with him. If you suffer with me, you'll reign with me. All of the future is not all that clear, but there's one thing's for certain. The future is the Lord Jesus Christ. The future is not what He makes. The future is Him. Remember that. The future is Him. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is the way into the future. And He's not finished with men when He raptures the church. When He calls His bride out of here, He's still not finished with mankind. And He's preparing us for something that's wondrous in the future. So Christ will be formed in you if you'll allow yourself to be led by the Spirit and humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and allow God to chasten you as a son. In other words, instruct you as a son and don't rebel against him. The fourth power arrayed against you, 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 1. The fourth power, demons, diamonion. 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse 1. The Spirit, capital S, speaketh, express, speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Now the faith is used here in the sense of all of the collective belief in Christ, the truth as it has been revealed to mankind, the truth as it is in Jesus, what we know to be true. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Notice the doctrines of devils. That is a power arrayed against you. What does that mean? That means that these are demonic doctrines. The New Age movement is loaded with demonic doctrines. What's that? You're God. No, you're not God. But the New Age movement teaches that. The New Age morphs into all kinds of various forms, shapes, doctrines. 
And these doctrines are very prevalent today. For example, if you go to Istanbul, Turkey, at one time that was Constantinople, named after Constantine, who in 313 AD defeated, uh, I forget a Roman, uh, his counterpart at the Milvian Bridge, and unified the Roman Empire, essentially, in a, in, in a matter of time, in some time, and moved its capital from Rome, moved it east to uh, Byzantium, or Constantinople. There is a church there in Constantinople that is called Hagia Sophia. It's no longer a church, it's a Muslim mosque. But the word Sophia is used to name that church. Now, what does the word Sophia mean? Some of you should know. Wisdom. Wisdom, wisdom. Sophia, means wisdom. It's the feminine of, 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 uh, of a form of wisdom, all right? So it is the church of the holy wisdom, Hagias, Hagias Sophia. Hagias means holy, holy wisdom. It is the church, therefore, of the feminine goddess, the feminine goddess. We get a lot of that today. This is where Mother Earth comes from. This is where Gaia comes from. This is where all these perverted doctrines that are changing the, 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 the sexual identity from male to female or the neutered identity and all this stuff is going on today and the churches are beginning to embrace it. And they're pulling in Eastern Hinduism, mixing up what Western culture and feeding it to the people. Listen carefully. It is so very, very important to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. What is the faith? That at the Lord Jesus Christ is the only name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty manifest in flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and He approaches God on our behalf as an intermediary, as a high priest. That there is the only way that you can be saved is by the grace of God. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. The gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Christians will disagree about the Sabbath. Christians will disagree about tongues. Christians will disagree about eschatology. Christians will disagree about polity, church polity, the way things are done, uh, 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 liturgy, all kinds of different things. Christians have and will disagree, but they're still Christians. Remember that. They're still Christians. They're still your brothers and sisters in Christ. But when they deny the virgin birth, they deny the blood atonement, they deny the Godhood, or the Godhead that Christ is, that salvation is by grace, they're not your brother or your sister. I mean, it's what they wear. So that's easy to, to, to understand when you confront a doctrine of a demon. And then number five, this is arrayed against you. And that is in uh, 2 Timothy chapter number two, and verse number 17, the scripture says, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. And who are they? Well, they were teaching something, verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow what? The faith. You see under how important faith is in the New Testament? Without it's impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently seek him by faith. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If he can destroy your faith in the word of God, he's destroyed your faith. Because if you don't believe the Bible, it's fancy. It's presumption. You live in la-la land. But if you do believe the Bible, then you have the basis for faith to grow. This is why the assault on the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. Now, Philetus and Hymenaeus and Philetus had taught the resurrection was past already. You could look at that in a number of different ways. Probably they spiritualized the resurrection and said it was not a physical event. And by doing that, then some of the people thought, well, I've missed it. I mean, well, my loved ones, the graves haven't opened. They're still out here. I mean, what good is this? If Christ be not risen, then our faith is in vain. Your loved ones have died in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 says, But now is Christ risen and become the first fruits of them that slept. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
if he can destroy your faith in the resurrection, yeah. then he's destroyed you completely because all you'll do then the rest of your life is compromise and you'll never believe anything. And that's exactly where Christianity, quote unquote, has arrived in this country. Now, now what is your defense? I'll give you three things tonight. These are your three things that I've listed as a defense against these five enemies arrayed against your faith. Let me go through them again. The flesh, the world, Satan, demons, and religion. A lot more could be said about these five things than I said tonight. But I'm going to get down here to what is your defense? Number one, the Word of God. In Matthew chapter number four and verse four, and I put it first because if you don't believe it, nothing, <laughs> nothing else matters. Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written. Now who did he say that to? Satan. He said it to Satan, the adversary. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you believe the Bible? That's very important, folks, because a lot of people don't. They believe the Bible is a good inspirational book that gives you good thoughts and, uh, and, and principles to live your life by. But as far as believing it, that it is accurate verbatim from Genesis to Revelation, the inspired Word of God without error, they don't believe that. But I believe that. So the Word of God, uh, when he said to Satan, he said, get thee hence. But how did he do that? He did that on the, the, on the authority of what he just quoted. Man shall not live by bread alone. He quoted the scripture. It is written, verse 7, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then in verse 10, he said, Get thee hence. Amen. Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 10 of the book of Matthew. The scripture. When times get hard, if you doubt, read the Bible. Amen. And when you read the Bible, say, Lord, open my heart to understand the word and receive the scripture. Give me light in the word of God. Amen. Talk to the author. He knows why he wrote it, and he knows what he said. Man did not write the Bible, folks. I've lived long enough to know men. Men did not write the Bible. They did not get, and as a matter of fact, is it's, it's a book that took nearly 2,000 years to write, depending on when Job was written. We don't know who wrote Job. Nobody knows who wrote Job. There's a lot of people that believe that Moses wrote Job. If Moses wrote Job, he wrote it about 1400 B.C. But we don't know that. We don't know that. And Job dates at 1,900 B.C., see? And the last book in the Bible is 95 A.D., so figure it up. 1,900 B.C. to 100 A.D., approximately. How long is that? That's nearly 2,000 years. How in the world could men write a book separated by that span of time and not fill it full of all kinds of contradictions and errors and mistakes and, you know, fantasy and junk and garbage. And yet one central theme runs through the whole book. And it complements itself because it has one author, the Holy Ghost. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of men. They didn't just will this to happen. But holy men of God spake as they were moved, inspired by the Holy Ghost. The book is inspired, folks. Inspired. Not the same way Shakespeare's inspired. Shakespeare's beautiful language, but it's not Scripture. There's a difference. This is inspired Scripture. The second thing, what is your defense? It's the Spirit. In 1 John chapter number 2 and verse 27. 1 John 2, 27. Going back to John again. And here's what he says, 1 John 2, 27. He says, the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. The truth is very important to God. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. God knows your heart. He knows whether you want the truth. He knows if you want to hide behind somebody, or something, or some church. He does. That's where you need to get it, get it right with God. 
do you really want the truth? Because if you really want the truth, he'll give you the truth. He'll give it to you. Now look what he said in John chapter number 14, verse 17. John 14, verse 17. Here's what he said. John 14, 17. He said, I pray the Father, verse 16, who sent another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. The Greek word transla translated comforter is parakletos, one who goes alongside of, to help, comfort, inspire, instruct. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth, the capital S, spirit, Holy Ghost of truth. Now watch this, whom the world cannot receive. Isn't that amazing? They can never receive it. Why? Because it goes contrary to what they are. You receive it because it witnesses to who's in you. Amen. See the difference? It witnesses. Yes, that's right. What you know is true. It witnesses to it. Even though, you're, even though your mind may be corrupted and you, and you repel it, uh, repel against it, it takes root Amen. because of who you are Amen. and who dwells in you and it will eventually bring forth fruit Amen. because it's the good seed so in verse, number, in verse number 17, the world cannot receive. Now when the Bible says cannot, it means it in the absolute sense. It is utterly impossible. Now I want you to notice in chapter number 15, verse 26, John. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, the Holy Ghost, whom I'll send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. That's your defense against these five powers arrayed against you. Number one, you believe the word of God and you quote it against your enemy. Confess it. Number two, the spirit of the living God who lives within you. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. You're, when he's present with you, everything is okay. When he's not present with you, nothing's okay. But he's always there. It's just that you're not conscious of it all the time. And then John chapter number 16, verse number 13, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he'll speak of what he hears in heaven. This guiding had a lot to do with the completion of the canon of Scripture. But it has a lot to do today with the understanding of that canon, the reception of the truth. But it had to do with the transmission of the truth to begin with. Amen. That means the writing of it, the giving of it, the, six, the 27 New Testament books that make up the whole Bible. They came from the hand of God. Holy men of God spake. And then finally, not only is your defense in the Word of God, but in the Spirit of God, but in the blood of God. In Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 13, the Scripture says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You see that? Now if you try to, if you try to take the blood out of the New Testament and and uh, <clears throat> what do you want to do? It sanitize it and turn it into a nice, clean religion. Yeah. You've taken the very heart out of our faith. That's right. For without the shedding of blood, there is no, there is none, you see. And you're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold received by vain tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, First Peter. So it's the blood. You say, why is it so necessary? Because God makes it that way. In Revelation 1, 5, he said, He who hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. And I know there are those who are teaching that the blood of Christ simply represents his life. In other words, blood, life, blood, life of the flesh is in the blood, so it represents his life. But he doesn't wash you in his life. He washes you in his blood. He washes you in his blood because in the Old Testament he taught them clearly that it was only by a vicarious death, the death of someone or something else could expiate or cleanse or do away with your sin. 
You can never shed your own blood to do away with your sin. It won't work. So it has to be somebody else's blood. And it has to be the perfect, sinless blood of the Lamb of God. The Bible said, to feed the church of God with, he hath purchased with his own blood. If God has blood, who is God's blood? Who's God and who's God's blood? You see, that's a direct reference to the Godhood and Godhead of the Lord Jesus Christ. It clearly says, Acts 20, 28, that the Lord Jesus Christ's blood is the blood of God. But here's, the, here, here's another reason, and this is a very important reason. Have you ever seen the blood? You've never seen it. None of you have seen the blood. You can't turn anything on this earth into His blood either. That won't work, John chapter number 6. You can't do that. That's called transubstantiation. That's not necessary. For the blood once shed, once shed, was eternal in its effect. But with the shedding this one time did he offer himself without spot to God. Amen. He'll purge your conscience from dead works. The shedding of blood, therefore, is something you can't see but you believe in. Amen. By believing in it, you're putting faith in it. Amen. I can see the word. I see it work, and I know it's true. I witness the Holy Ghost. I sense him. I can feel him. I know he's here, but I can't see the blood, but that brings the element of faith into it. For without that faith, you can't please God. So what am I doing? I'm putting faith in what somebody else did to take care of my sin. That's why it's so important. You see what I'm saying? This takes me out of the equation. My works can't work. It won't work. My good deeds won't do it. I can't add to it either. Amen. What I can do is I can say, Lord God, you loved me enough to go to a cross and there die and shed your precious blood Amen. for my sins. I believe that's good enough. Amen. I believe that will do the job. Amen. And I put faith in the blood Amen. of the crucified one. Amen. Now what you've done when you've done that is you've exercised faith in the grace of God for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. He has given to us the Lamb of God who has died for us in our place, shed His blood, not mine. I accept the blood sacrifice of my Lord Jesus Christ to satisfy God, and because of that I can rest in His finished work. And when I rest in what He did for me, the grace of God brings salvation to my soul and washes my sins away when I've trusted Him. If you don't trust that what Jesus Christ did was enough to save you or keep you saved, you will work yourself into insanity trying to please God. You want to please God as an effect of what's happened to you because you are saved, just like you want to keep the Ten Commandments because you are saved. Don't ever get the cart before the horse. Keeping commandments and pleasing God never saves anybody. It's a result of one who has been saved. The Bible says that we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm not good enough to go to heaven. I never will be good enough to go to heaven. I can never do enough to go to heaven. I can never punish myself enough to go to heaven. I can't do it, folks. I can't do it. And on top of that, you are really calling God a liar. I want you to go back with me now to the book of 1 John that I preached on Sunday morning, and I'll close with it here. 1 John chapter number 5. Verse number 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, Holy Spirit. He that believeth not God hath made, God forbid, made him a liar because he believeth not 
the record that God gave of His Son. Now, I didn't preach on this Sunday morning. Look at the next verse. Look at it carefully. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. Hallelujah. And this life is in His Son. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, that you've given me eternal life. I'll not call God a liar. Bless the name. Bless the Lamb. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to use what I've said tonight. Glorify thyself, not me, but thee, Lord, and thee alone. Lift up that sweet holy name, the blessed name of Jesus. Bless that sweet name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In thy name I pray. Amen. It's good to have Ron Widener with us tonight. He